John chapter 4, verses 1 through 30. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meats. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. For whence then hast thou the living water, that living water? Are thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself? and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband. And that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto her, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said, saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Now Mr. Griffith will come and sing for us. The world will try to satisfy that longing in your soul. You may search the wide world o'er, but you'll be just as before. You'll never find true satisfaction until you found the Lord. For only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Satisfy your soul, only Jesus can satisfy your soul, and only He can change your heart and make you whole. He'll give you peace you never knew, love and joy and heaven too. For only Jesus 
can satisfy your soul if you could have the fame and fortune all the wealth you could obtain yet you have not christ within your living here would be in vain there'll come a time when death shall call you riches cannot help you then so come to jesus for only he can satisfy satisfy your soul jesus solo te satisfacerá y solo él cambia tu ser mi nuevo sois él te da paz inmensa paz un dulce amor celeste hogar pues Jesús solo te satisfacerá satisfy your soul only Jesus can satisfy your soul and only he can change your heart and make you whole he'll give you peace you never knew love and joy in heaven too for only jesus can satisfy your Thank you, Mr. Griffith. That was wonderful. That is so true. Jesus can satisfy your soul in a way that the world can't. That is the truth. Now, Jesse just read one of the most, to me, one of the, my favorite passages in the book of John. It is one of my favorite passages. Book of John, there's two chapters that I love every time I read. That's the first chapter, the word, in chapter four, the woman of Samaria. Because in this chapter, you see so vividly the heart and the character of Jesus Christ. If you're a skeptic this evening, if you're somebody that's wondering, who is this Christ that Pastor Chan and Brother Roop and Coons and Griffith sing and preach and who is this guy? If you're one of those that is skeptical about who this Jesus is and what is that we are telling you, find out for yourselves, read the whole chapter of John chapter four and read the story of the Samaritan woman, how Jesus deals with her and cares for her at every stage and every part. You will see who is this Jesus that we preach, his whole heart and character, his whole attributes are beautifully displayed in this story, beautifully displayed. We're gonna go over a few things and I hope that you guys can join me as we touch on a few parts, you know, we're not gonna go over everything, but just so you understand and see who this Jesus is. This is my favorite chapter, my favorite story in the whole Bible from Jesus. This is like, I could spend hours just thinking about it because Jesus is, who he say he is, and you see it here so clearly. Now, the title of my message is Jesus Satisfies the Thirsty Soul. And this is my verse. This is the, my text this morning, this evening, sorry. I was thinking I was still preaching in the morning. So 
Jesus, so John 4, 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said unto her, the woman of Samaria, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give, I shall give him, shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, C.H. Spurgeon said, commenting on this verse, that all things that are of earth are unsatisfactory. Our spirits, our spirit carbs, looks for something more than time and sense can yield. Nothing which comes from cups of earth, even if it should yield a transient or temporal satisfaction, it won't last or fully satisfy. Pointing to the water in Jacob's well, our Lord said, he that drinks of this water shall thirst again. Jesus had just asked the Samaritan woman for a drink of cold water from Jacob's well. If you recall from the passage that Jesse just read, now Jesus and his disciples had just traveled for many miles on the road to Galilee. They were tired. And we read that as they were traveling, they passed through Samaria, which was, which was one of the capital, was, what was once the capital of the Northern Kingdom. Now in Samaria, there was a well that was built by Jacob. This was a well where you can draw water out and the people of Samaria will go there usually to take water out in the evenings usually. Uh, obviously that back then, you didn't have a faucet, we just turned the water on. Back then you go to a well and pull water out. You still see that in third world countries. Now, it was noon and the time when Jesus was there, when he got there with his disciples. And so Jesus took the opportunity to sit there at that well as his disciples went out to the city to buy something to eat. Now, this is what I, what I will call in this part here, a divine appointment. So what happens there? Well, we read in verse seven and eight that a woman of Samaria comes out from her home to draw water out. It was 12 at noon. So Jesus, having traveled many miles, asked this woman that was there for a drink from Jacob's well. But what happens? Well, we read and Jesse read that she rebuffs him. She rebuffs him because of the social barriers that separate them. Now, Back then, you have to understand that in the time of Jesus, you had the man and woman barrier. Back in that day, you wouldn't go out there and speak to a woman alone. That was inappropriate. The other issue, the other barrier that you see here is the Jew and Samaritan barrier. Back then, the woman, the uh, Samaritans and Jews did not relate. It's a long story behind that, but that's what it is. Um, they wouldn't talk. The Jewish were clean, pure race, and the Samaritans were conquered by the Assyrians. And so they, one of the things that the military did is they scattered them and they intermarried with other cultures. So obviously it was not a pure race. They were not pure Jews. So when the Exodus came and when they were, they came out of, uh, uh, they were captive by Babylonian and the Assyrians were captive. That some of the Jews were in, 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 in Assyria and the other ones were in Babylonia. When they came back to rebuild the temple, the Jews said, no, I'm not gonna, don't, don't bring people from, from, from Samaria. They're not real Jews. And so there is tension there, tension between the Samaritans and the real Jews from the tribe of Judah. It's giving you some background. So Jesus, so this woman here is from Samaria. Jesus is a Jew. She, he rebuffs, she rebuffs him. One, obviously she was a woman and he was a man. And, she, and, and then she was Samaritan and he was a Jew. So these were rules that were set by the state. But here's what I want you to see here. 
Jesus bypasses all those rules. You see, for Jesus, it didn't matter. Those were rules made by man. He was here in the, on earth, and he was all about his father's business. It didn't matter politics. It didn't matter what the governor said. It didn't matter anything. He was in the mission to win this woman, to, to, to witness to this woman, to bring, to save this woman. That should help us see something about the character of Christ. doesn't matter, you know, you have, we go to Central Avenue to preach, and now you have the Black Lives Matter, and you have, you know, everybody's trying to bring the cultures together. Well, you have Jesus. You know, you have this state mandate. Jesus bypassed everything. It didn't matter. I'm going to win this woman. I'm going to bring this woman to Christ. I'm going to bring it to myself. I was Christ himself. So you have this. And, and it, it tells us that, you know, man, it, tell, it teaches you a lot about man. One of the things that it teaches you about man is that man feels, you know, it, it breaks, it burns all, all, all bridges. You know, we, we separate ourselves. We, we cause divisions. We, we say this is from this group and this is from that group. And I only speak to them and I don't speak to, to, to him and her or whatever. But Jesus brings people together. Here you have a Jew bringing and witnessing and bringing together a woman from Samaria. I just, I just, just think about the heart of Christ. Think about you, if you're a Christian, about what God is calling us to do in the field. You see, this is important. And that's, and we see that all across the scriptures. Now, here's what's, what's interesting. You see Jesus comes and, and looks at this woman and asks this woman for a drink. Now, you would think that she will say, well, yeah, I'm not going to give you a drink. But this is, what he, this is what she says. She says, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. But now here you see Jesus reply. This is what Jesus, Jesus says. If you knew the gift of God, who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you will have asked him and he will have given you living water. So get into the story here. He's, she rebuffed him. Saying to you, what are you asking me for water for? I mean, first of all, I'm from Samaria. You're a Jew. What are you asking me water for? Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God. And who it is who says to you, give me a drink. You who have asked him. And he will have given you living water. In a way, he's revealing himself to her. He's letting her know, look, do you know who you're speaking with? Do you know who you're talking with? He's asking her for a drink of temporal, cheap, 99 cent store water. And look what he's offering back. Look what he's saying. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink. You will have asked him, and he will have given you living water. Living water. What is that? This is eternal water. This is spiritual. This is spiritual water. Obviously, do you think Jesus really needed the water from the well? No. He needed anything from anyone. He didn't need anything from her. He was there for a purpose. This was a divine appointment. He asked her for some cheap water. That's all she, he did. He asked her for cheap water, water that you drink a little bit and you go back and thirst again. But he's offering her 
in return, in exchanging, exchanging for cheap water, living water. Do you understand what's happening here? Do you understand what's the great exchange here? He's asking her for temporal water from the Jacob's well, and he's giving her back living water, spiritual water. Now the woman of Samaria heard the truth coming from the words of Christ, but she totally missed it. Instead of paying attention, she again rebuffs him with questions by telling him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then you get the living, that living water that you're talking about? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. So you see here how her response is mixed in with questions of unbelief and even with a bit of sarcasm because he had nothing to draw water with. He saw him like a mere man, like you're asking me for water. You're, you're offering me living water and then you're asking me for water. What is this? I mean, you have nothing to draw with. And what? I mean, you are greater than my father, Jacob? I mean, come on. Our father, Jacob, gave us this well. He fed his cattle, drunk, drank, you know, his cattle, his family. This is, notice how she's stuck in a physical, temporal realm, like many of you. Many of you are stuck. Many of you are like this woman of Samaria. Have, I mean, have you, if you just think about it, if you really immerse yourself, and to the story, you will see that you yourself are exactly like that. If you're unconverted, you are. We preach the truth here. We preach the word. We tell you Jesus is good, love, wonderful, beautiful. He's eternal. He, he wants the best of you. You don't believe it. She didn't believe living water? What is that? Look, Jacob's water. Come on. Physical water, quench my thirst for a little bit. And you're offering me? Like, what are you doing? So this is where, again, Jesus understands what he's dealing with. He knows what's going on here. She's seen, he sees that she's being worldly in a way, earthly thinking earthly, not spiritual, but he goes ahead and moves forward and wants to win this woman, wants to draw this woman to himself. This is the character of Christ. I want you to think about yourself and how you relate in this story, where you're at in this story, especially if you're skeptical about Christ, if you're skeptical about the preaching, if you're skeptical about everything you heard today this morning, every time you pres we present to you Christ and you reject him, it means you don't believe anything that we say about Jesus. It means like you're like with like this woman who sees Jesus as this strange person. It's not, you don't believe that he is who we say he is. But I want you to find out for yourself. You have here the attributes of God. Beautifully displaying his character and his responses to this woman. He's trying to win this woman. He's trying to help her, compel her to trust in him. That what he has to offer him, her, sorry, is greater than what she could offer him greater in every sense so jesus says this this is how she he answers her john 4 13 and 14 jesus says whosoever drink it of this water shall thirst again but whosoever drink it of the water that i shall give him shall never thirst 
but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now I want you to see something. I want you to see how Jesus helps this woman see beyond what she was perceiving from Christ. Not all of us have an idea, a perception of who Christ is. Any of us before our conversion can put yourself in, in, in this woman's shoes. All of us have an idea, a perception of who Christ is. Whether it's right or wrong, we all have a perception. We all have an idea of who Christ is or who we think he is. Now, this woman of Samaria was influenced by her culture, by her customs, by how she was raised, by her religion, by other factors that are not mentioned here, I'm sure. But know how Jesus cuts right through all the barriers that she put forth to reach her soul. Now, that's what we as Christians are commanded to do, not in the same perfection and accuracy as our Lord Jesus Christ, but to a certain capacity. If you're a Christian, I'm speaking to you. We are to bring down barriers and build bridges to reach the souls of men like Jesus did. We should reach those in, who are our neighbors, our friends, our relatives, strangers. We should cut through the barriers to reach their souls. We are to do our best like our Lord Jesus Christ here to reach out. Even those that are the most sinful. Like Jesus did here. You have this woman. Full of unbelief. Full of questions. Sarcastic. And not only that. She's an adulterer. She had five husbands. And not only that. She was a liar. She lied to Jesus. She told Jesus. I don't have a husband. And then she says no. You're right. You don't have a husband. You have five. And the one you have is not your husband. Expose her sin. That's what Jesus does. That's what we do. That's what our pastor does. That's what we do. We should, this story is not, and it's not just a romantic story for you to just, okay, it was a nice story. No, it's for you to engage. To engage. And see all what's going on here. This is one of those stories that you meditate on. Think about. Because this is us. This is the people that we are trying to win. They come up with all kinds of barriers. If you're a Christian, you know that. Your families, your friends, your neighbors. They have all these reasons why they should reject the Savior. That's true. And their culture, their upbringing, everything, they are, their sexual orientation, their nationality. The five protected classes in California, all these things influence the mindset of the people we're trying to reach. Same-sex marriage and this and that, and they bring all these barriers. And they miss the mark. They miss Jesus. But Jesus here is trying to reach this woman. He loves this woman and tells her, whosoever drink it of this water shall thirst again. Here, she, here Christ comes and tears down one of the biggest walls here. One, what is it? That this woman was living in a temporal realm. She, he missed, she missed everything Jesus said. He offered her living water. And she, she went and started questioning him, what, what water? I mean, Jacob's well, I mean, look, this wonderful water we have here. She, she missed the exchange, the great exchange, the infinite exchange. You give me temporal water and I'll give you living water. What could be better than that? And so some of you do the same thing. Pastor Chan preach a wonderful gospel message, gives you Eternal, an eternal perspective gives you living water, presents to you Christ. 
and you reject him, just like this woman in the well. That's your condition. That's your condition if you're lost. So today, I want to focus on, the, on this verse, on John 4, 13, 14. Because I think that some of you who are holding back here are like this woman of Samaria who was religious but lost, who was in sin, and when she was confronted with a spiritual truth, instead of responding spiritually, she responds with her own ideas and misconceptions of what she thought Jesus meant, but the water of life. So Jesus answered and said unto her, whosoever drink it of this water shall thirst again. Jesus is telling you that this evening. You like the water that you drink. I know some of you are drinking that water right now. Whosoever drink it of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drink it of the water that I, not me, Jesus, the water that Jesus gives you shall never thirst. But the water that I should give you shall be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Everlasting life. So first, Jesus teaches that the water of this earth will not fully quench your thirst nor satisfy your soul. Yes, Jesus said, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Now, these are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what could be more true than that? Whosoever drinketh from the waters of this temporal life shall thirst again. And you could try that because you could drink this temporal water. And three hours later, you need, it, you need more. This is a picture, a metaphor of life under the sun. Life on earth, your life. That's the truth. Jesus makes it clear here that he is not talking about the water in Jacob's well. No, but rather he's making a contrast between the water holes of this world and the water that he offers. Jesus points out in his statement that first, when you read this text, you see the contrast. He says, first, natural water satisfies a little. It is earthly, natural, and temporal. That's what he suggests in this passage, in this text. Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. So natural water satisfies little. It is earthly, natural, and temporal. Second, he points out that living water, however, satisfies completely and without end. Third, this same passage, he points out that whoever drinks natural water will eventually die. It will only keep a person alive for so long. But he says that whoever drinks the spiritual living water that he gives will never die. Now, this is the great exchange. You give, you drink. He asks for temporal water to satisfy himself a little bit. And he offered her living water. Now, think about it. Because I have all these, when I'm I was preparing this sermon, there's so much meat here. There's so much spiritual things to learn. Who are you? I mean, think about it. If you think about who are you, that in any way you can bless the Savior, that you can bless the Lord. I mean, you have a sinful, a woman who is in deep sin. And here you have the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, asking her, give me a drink. Give me a drink. In what way do I feel fit? In any way that I could bless the Savior. He was thirsty. He was a man. He was thirsty. He was a man. Think about it. But he's God. He didn't need anything from her. Yet, in his humanity, in everything that 
he was when he came to earth. He asked this woman, bless me with a with drink of water. He meant it. He was not playing a game with her. He meant it. He wanted water. And I will give you living water. I will give you something greater than what you can give me. If you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. When we came to Christ, we gave what to him? We gave him our sins. And what did he give us? He gave us eternal life. That's the great exchange. We give him our sins. We give him our problems. We give him everything we don't deserve. We, we deserve, which is punishment, hell. And he gives us what? Eternal life. You have a picture here in this story. Jesus asking this woman for this temporal water. Give me a drink. And I will give you living water blows my mind blows my mind but that's the reality that should humble us now third he points out that whoever drinks natural water will eventually die it will only keep a person alive for so long but he says that whoever drinks the spiritual living water that he gives will never die now, this is what Jesus was getting at. This was the information that when he gave this, this statement to her, this is what he wanted her to grasp. He wanted that information to resonate with her, to lead her, to help her, to pull her out from the world, from her temporal cravings. But she did not. Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you will have asked him and he will have given you living water. That blows me away because I rejected the Savior the same way. Many times when it was presented to me in the gospel. I remember when I got convicted, I just kept rejecting the gospel. And one day, Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, come unto me or give me a drink. Give me your sins. Give me your sins. Give me, give me your, your problems. You will have asked him and he will have given you living water. I did that. I'm guilty of that. I was like this woman in Samaria, just confounded, living in this temporal realm. Obviously, we read her response after that and saw that she did not grasp the spiritual message that Jesus wanted her to understand. It breaks my heart when I read this story because I go back to myself. I go back to people that I love, that I want to win. And they respond like that. Now, the Bible says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That's what the Bible teaches about you and your lost condition. The natural man, the woman of Samaria, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness. Unto her and unto you, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. What does that mean? It means that they can only be discerned through a spiritual lens, not through your mind, not through your senses, not through your research on the computer, not through your reasoning. You need a spiritual lens to understand spiritual truths and so he gave her a spiritual truth and she responded with uh, with her reasoning with her own ideas just like you do every time you hear the gospel you want to use your own methodology you want to use your own reasoning your own religion your own way of viewing life to understand the supernatural 
the spiritual. You're going to always make the same mistakes. Every time Pastor Chan stands and gives you the gospel, you get the same result because you respond like this woman with the same reasoning. You want to use your own intellect, your own emotions, your own feelings, your sight to come and understand and apprehend the spiritual. No, the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. For first, you have to acknowledge that they are foolishness unto him. If you try to reason the spiritual with your mind, the only thing you're going to conclude is that it's foolishness. That's going to be your conclusion. Everything we say is foolishness to you. And until you get that, you will always be making the same sense. You will be sleeping like that man back there. You will be doing the same thing because it is foolishness. And you can't stay awake because you know what? The fact is, it is foolishness to you. Even what I'm saying right now, it bores you to death. Just like this woman here. Had no idea what Jesus was talking about. The natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, neither can he know them because they need to be discerned with the spiritual lens. Now, obviously this woman was entertaining herself, was drinking some, was drinking water, but it was the temporal water of this life. And like many of you, you yourself drink the same water that she drinks to satisfy yourself, to satisfy your soul, to try to cover up what really is happening inside. There's a struggle within you. You don't understand Jesus. You don't understand everything spiritual, but you put that aside and you still are living, but you live for self. And you look for things to do to feel accomplished, to feel like you're part of something, to not, so that you can feel like, like your existence has some sort of meaning, some sort of purpose. Now, this woman here was obviously committing adultery. She was not satisfied in her relationships. And you can tell because Jesus exposed her to her sins. She had, she had five husbands, and the man that she had was not even her husband. So this woman was longing for something, and Jesus knew that. Jesus was gentle and loving and caring. She was longing for something inside, just like you who are unconverted are longing for something this evening. When you leave this church and you go back to your life, regular life, there's one thing you're going to do. I don't know what that is, but you know what that is. Something that fills your heart and mind. Just like this woman will go back where her sins with looking for a husband, looking for a mate, finding somebody to give her purpose and meaning in her life. Regardless of whether she was committing adultery, it didn't matter to her because her cravings, the boy, the emptiness that was filling inside her was eating her up. She needed to look for something. She needed, she was searching for something. Life was hard. Remember, she was at 12 o'clock there by herself in Jacob's well. Why was she at 12 o'clock noon by herself there? Now, tradition, the culture in that time tells us that people will go and, and draw water at at six o'clock when it was not so hot. That's the truth. The truth is people will go in the evening because it was too hot to bring water out. But why was she at 12 noon there by herself and no one else? Because you know why? In, Sam in Samaria, she was known for being what? An adulterer, taking other women's husbands away sleeping around with men. And so she had to go by herself because or else probably the people will want to stone her or something. Back then, you can't get away with adultery the way you do here. Back then, you get stoned. 
I don't know, Samaria, now the laws were a little bit different, but think about that. She was by herself. Last, last week, Pastor Chen preached a wonderful message, the loneliness of sin. Sin makes you lonely, just like this woman. She had to go in the heat to draw water out because everybody else probably stoned her. Get away from me. Oh, you're the one that is after my husband. You see, she was lonely by herself. But Jesus' compassion and love for that woman was so great, so immense. This is who Jesus is. So immense, so great that he stood in that well waiting for her to come out knowing in his omniscience that he was going to encounter her. And that was going to be her, his opportunity to witness to her, to win her to himself, to save her soul. Think about that. The loneliness of sin. I was a sinner. I was very lonely when I sinned. Lonely. Because loneliness, because trust me, if you're, a, if you're a sinner, if you're somebody that backbites everybody else, if you're the one that talks before people's back, people don't like you. Now, you might think you do. But people don't like you. People know that you're this person that just backbites everybody else. Nobody wants to talk to you. So you're lonely. You think you have a lot of friends, but you don't. They all hate you. If you're somebody that is chasing after, lusting after somebody else's man or woman, the same thing. Oh, watch out. Watch out. He's one of those that is going after, you know, strange, you know, strange flesh or prostitutes or this and that. Nobody wants to handle, talk to somebody like that. Somebody is watching pornography. No woman's going to want to marry a man that watches pornography. No way. You see, lo the loneliness of sin. You have this American woman, a lonely, lonely, lonely woman. At 12 noon, in the scorching heat, bringing water. And what does, he do? what does she do? Throws her religion to Jesus. Jesus is offering her living water. An exchange of some temporal water. And what, what does she do? Oh, you're not greater than Jacob, who gave us this well. And she's still resting on her temporal realm. Resting. Oh, I'm okay here with my cheap water. Next, next two hours, I'll be thirsty again. I will have to come here and draw again. We know that, that in the passage that Jesse read, that even after she responds to Jesus, what does she do? She says, well, give me this water. And if I have this water, would that mean that I won't have to come here anymore to draw any more water? You see how she's thinking? She's still not a Christian yet, but think about it. She's trying to see what she can get. What are the benefits? And rejecting Jesus, you see. But Jesus deals with her. The compassion, the love, the heart of Christ to keep. I'm going to win. I love this woman. I'm going to win her. She's an adulterer. She's blind. She has issues, but I love her. And that's what Jesus is doing to you. He's telling you every time a preacher stands here and preaches. Every time Pastor Chan here and preaches. Every time Mr. Roop or a brother is teaching. We want you to see who Jesus is. Who is this person that you're rejecting? If you just knew who is this God. If you just knew who is this person that you are negating, you are rejecting, you are refusing to give water. If you just knew, oh, you would just ask me for the living water and I will give it to you. You see, this is who Jesus is. This is who Jesus is. Now, many today, unfortunately, they drink the temporal water that this life gives them. Even though it only quenches their thirst for a little bit, they're still right there, sticking their nose, 
in the water that is only going to satisfy for a little bit. You have the carnal appetites that we see. I mean, you see that in, in Glenda. We go to preaching, we see men back and forth, materialism, the mall. You see people watching pornography, just all the different things that people are involved with, music, satisfying their soul, trying to cover up the reality of what's going on inside. That's what you do. That's why you go home after church and you turn the computer on to watch a movie. And I'm not saying I don't. I watch movies. I'm talking about you if you're not a Christian. You go and instead of thinking about Jesus and what he can offer you, you will rather spend your time and life in a movie, playing endless of video games, watching pornography, instead of submitting to Christ. Waiting for the right time, waiting for God, submitting, believing Jesus, that what he's going to give you is better than you can ever get yourself. That's what Jesus is offering. That's what she off he offered this woman, something greater, better, precious, eternal, that she could not get on her own. She will never find that on her own. You have brothers and sisters in the church. Now, you that come often who are here and who will do anything for you. You know who they are. And it's not just the young, but the adults. Pick you up. You need a ride, we'll pick you up. You need help in school, we'll help you. But then you go to work and you find those friends who all they can do is lead you to more and more sin and to lead you to drugs, alcohol, sex outside of marriage, and you, and you follow these people who are giving you what? Who are, what, they, what is that they're offering you? This cheap temporal satisfaction, this temporal water, which is never going to fully satisfy you. You should look at the Christians in the church and say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. This is precious. These people really care for me. They care for me like my mom, like my dad, like my brothers and sisters. That's a picture of Christ. That should be, that should resonate like, whoa, this is like, these people are like Jesus Christ who are offering me living water, living water, offering me, obviously, you know, we're, we're men, but we're going to be here for you. We're not going to dismiss you. We're not going to forget about you. We're going to be here consistent for you because we were saved by Jesus. And just like you, just like you who are lost right now, you who are struggling right now, you who are making up your mind whether you should be in this church or not or whether you should listen to us. Listen to the words of Jesus. Listen to the words of Christ because he's offering you living water. Not what your lost friends are offering you. Sex outside of marriage, sin, pornography, drugs, alcohol. Which will lead you to a life on earth. Real bad. Real bad. Loneliness. The loneliness of sin. You'll be lonely the rest of your life. Instead of having a family. The family of God. I wonder if someone this... Even in here, this evening, you have tasted the temporal shallow waters that this world gives and are not satisfied, are not filled, are not refreshed. Maybe you're still thirsty for and looking for better waters, more refreshing to the soul. Remember, Jesus is talking here spiritually. You need to do a spiritual inventory right now of what's missing in your life. A spiritual inventory. Because if you go to a physical inventory, well, you have a house, have a, a car. I remember Brother Timothy Chan. He had everything. He had everything. But how I wish that some of you had the same feelings that he had before he came to Christ. He would tell me, Brother, I have everything. I don't need money. I don't need this. My, my parents have something I don't have. It's missing. There's something missing. 
But he, you know what he did? That I don't see many of you do. He did a spiritual inventory, not a material, physical inventory. He had school. He had everything. He did a spiritual inventory. And he was empty. There was nothing for him to write. He was looking for something to write. There was nothing. Zero. That's the condition that many of you are in. How many of you wake up in the mornings, in the night like he did, and do a spiritual mentoring and find nothing to write? Well, if you're Phil, if you say, I don't need that, then there's nothing for Jesus to tell you. There's nothing I can say that will help you. But if you won, if you're concerned about your soul, you will do a spiritual mentoring and see if there's anything you can write. And I'm talking about religion. I'm like, well, I have a church and I have this. No, a spiritual mentory. And you will see how empty you are. Because that's what happened to her. She tasted the waters of this temporal life. And God began to work. Jesus began to work in her heart. And began to show her. As you read the story, you can do, you can read yourself. How empty she was. She, she started going to religion. And, you know, which mountain should I worship and all that. You can see how she's trying to figure out, well, it looks like you're a prophet because now you revealed to me something that, that only I knew that I was an adulterer. How did, she, how did he know that? So you can see how Jesus begins to work. And God is working in your heart. If he is working in your heart, he's revealing to you the same things that he revealed to this woman of Samaria. That there's something wrong, but you need to do a spiritual mentoring. A heart check, as our pastor says. Now, heart check is not your physical heart. That's your soul. That's deep in. That's spiritual. Pastor Chen speaks about this, your spiritual inner core. He's not talking about whether you're filled with food or filled with water or if you're satisfied with, you have everything at home, everything you need or your car or a job. He's asking about spiritual things. Are you going to be like Samaritan woman who asks, well, I mean, look at this well? No. Jesus was trying to convey to this woman something spiritual. So please receive the message with the spiritual lens. Ask God. God, I don't understand. I need spiritual help. Spiritual help here. Maybe if that's happening, maybe if you do a spiritual mentor, you will see that something is missing. Something is missing. And I hope that truly and finally you will realize that really you have everything like Timothy had everything but it was void inside there was nothing nothing inside him and he began to strive strive I want this living water I want this living water I want this living water and he tried religion. He tried being in church. He was the first one to be there, the last one to live. He was an usher. He did this. He did that. And he was unsatisfied. Nothing brought him peace. Nothing. Zero. This woman does the same thing. Oh, which mountain should I worship? You say to worship here. I said to worship there. And what is Jesus says? He that worships, worships in spirit and truth. He's speaking spiritually. He's telling her, wake up. I'm speaking spiritual truth here. It's not where. It's not a location. It's not a place. I'm speaking. I'm giving you spiritual food. And so am I right now. So Pastor Chan this morning. So Pastor Chan will be doing this evening again. He's giving you spiritual food. Perceive it, please, with your spiritual lenses. Try to. Work hard to ask God, help me. You can't, the natural man receive it now. You need to ask God for it. You need to ask God for it. Please open up my eyes so that I can see spiritual truth. That's what I'm talking about here. Well, second and last, Jesus teaches that the water that he gives you will quench your thirst and satisfy your soul. Jesus said, 
But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him, that I, Jesus, will give him, shall be in him a well of water springing up, springing up into everlasting life. Yes, Jesus says here in our text that the living water that he gives satisfies completely and without end. Now, we know, of course, that Jesus himself is that living water and that we drink him in by believing and obeying his word. Now, I want you all to see this. What Jesus is promising here in our text, what he's telling us is that if we drink this water, that if you drink this water, you will never be thirsty again. Never. This is a promise. You will never be thirsty again. That's what he's promising you. That's what he told the woman at the well. That if she drank from him, that she will not thirst. But not only that, he promises even more than that. For it says, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, what does that mean? It means that not only will you not be thirsty if you drink from him, but that one drink is enough to produce in you a well for an eternity of drinks. That's a quotation from a great theologian of the day but now think about it one drink is enough to produce in you a well for an eternity of drinks in you 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 one drink is enough to produce in you a well of drinks now how does that look like well look at the woman at the end of the story when you are thirsty and you quench your thirst with, with, with water, and you have a little bit left, what do you do? Well, I'm not gonna, you're not gonna do that, but you share it. You can share water. If you have abundant, so much water, you start giving it all out. You become a well in you. You share the good news. You go out there and this is what it looks like when you have drank Jesus in. When you have drank him in, what does it look like? It looks like the woman of Samaria. That's how it looks like. You become a well of water. People come and drink from you. I could see my sister, Laura. I could see my wife when family, they're empty. There's no water. They're dry. They come to my wife and ask questions, spend a good time, spend a Friday with us. Because it's, it's beautiful. You have somebody that tells you good news. Look at Mrs. Song. You become a well of water. Look at Timothy. His charisma transfer, uh, uh, changes the, the atmosphere of a place. He's just sharing love, water, living water for everybody. Look at Pastor Chan. You go home to his house. You have abundant of things. He's not going, oh, don't touch this. Oh, don't grab that. You ask him for a drink, he gives you a drink. You can ask him for food. He cooks food for you. You look at his wife. That's what it is. That's what it looks like. You say, what does it look like? That's what it looks like. A person becomes a spring, a well of water, giving people life, energizing people, encouraging like Brother Coons, encouraging the people, giving us a word of exhortation when all of us are down. Wake up. And everybody wakes up. He's exhorting us. He's sharing what Jesus has done in his life. Look at Mr. Griffith. He just went and sang. He shared with you what? That well of water. He's got, he's filled with water. He wants to share it. That's what it looks like. The woman of Samaria, what did she do? She went back to her people who didn't want her because she was an adulteress. But her changed life led to what? Her changed life led for women and men who were probably didn't like her at all, 
her changed life led for these people to see what happened to her. Let's go find out what happened because he's, she's proclaiming Christ the Messiah is here and, and obviously they didn't believe in Christ the Messiah. Something you understand and if you study the, the, the story well, you understand that they believe in a different type of Messiah, a type of King David. The Samaritans didn't believe in the, the crucified Christ. They believe in something else. But they're Opens eyes, their eyes are open now. Why? Because this woman is transformed. Because her life reflects something she was never. She was never like that. She was just different, different, a different person. And they wanted to go find out what happened, who was this Christ that she was presenting. That's what happens. That's what it looks like. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. It will be spiritual. That's what it means. It means it will be something spiritual. Something you can't put your finger on. Because you see, when you look at the media and when you look at social media and you look at all of that, people point their fingers at the car that they drive. When people judge other people, when men judge other men, they point their finger and they have something to point their finger at. Something physical like, look at this cell phone, look at this car. This is the language of the world. Look at the, 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 the woman, that beautiful woman that, that this man is, has, and look at his husband, this beautiful, hus uh, wonderful, good-looking husband, and look at the money, look how much money he has. Look at the house. Wow. You point the finger, you can look at those things. And what does those things do for you? Nothing. All you're doing is bragging about what somebody else has. How does that benefit you? Nothing, zero. But think about what you do. Every time you're on social media and you're glamour by the trinkets that the devil puts in your face. You're glamored by the woman that you see there, or the man that you see there. You're mesmerized by all those trinkets, where it's just, which is all fake. All it will pass away. It will be. It will disappear. It would turn into nothing. But you're glamored by those things. You're mesmerized by those things, and you shouldn't be. This woman, the only attraction that she had. If anyone listened to her, it was because of one thing, the living water that she had, that she was sharing. And you can see her life change and bring it all together and see, wow, something really changed here. She's a different person. And she's preaching something, someone that I, I never... I mean, the goodness of God and Jesus Christ, the same thing we're preaching to you. That's what we're preaching. That's what she did. She went back and preached that same Christ. And that was the only attraction. So the people came to find out, to talk, to listen to this man, Jesus Christ. And there was a revival there. Many, scripture says, records, came to know the Lord Jesus Christ through this woman's testimony that's a beautiful story that is true that is real that's what it looks like but the water that i shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life a christian will always tell you the truth will always tell you what you need to hear. Jesus Christ did not pull hold back, did not pull back from telling this woman the truth, that she was a sinner, that she had five husbands, and that the man that she was with was not her husband. A Christian tells you the most truth. Your best friend will tell you the most truth. Sometimes it won't be easy to swallow, Sometimes it will be hard. Yet, if, if, if he's truly your friend, 
If a person truly, truly loves you, he will tell you what you need to hear in spite of how you feel, regardless of anything. That doesn't mean that that person doesn't love you. That person actually loves you more than anyone else because he tells you the truth. Jesus told this woman the truth. Did not shy away from it, but offer her, but offer her living water in exchange of her temporal water that will only quench his thirst for a few hours. That's the great exchange. I just hope before Pastor Chen comes to give us a word to end this sermon, that you will listen to him, that you will listen to him, that you listen to him. Pastor Chen, thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Let's all stand for a minute. Let's stretch a little bit. All right. Stretch, stretch a little bit and then please be seated. Every time someone speaks from behind this pulpit, we present to you what you could have. We talk, about, we talk about eternal life. We talk about God. We talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. We talk about becoming a child of God, become part of the family of God. Tonight you heard about being offered living water that will always satisfy. But, but the most important thing and the reason why you find yourself cut off from God is because you don't have a desire, a thirst for these things with which we speak. You see, you're trapped in the material world. And how do you know that? Because in your time alone, what do you think about? As the service is dismissed, what will you do? Will you go to a friend and talk about the wedding? And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with the wedding. But that doesn't help your soul, you see. That's not germane and relevant to your soul. So really the question, as I see it, regarding the woman at the well is, do you have a thirst for eternal things? Because every time we speak, my, I myself, one of my brothers speak, we always try to present to you a spiritual need to know God, to have forgiveness of sins, to have eternal life. We present the need. But is there on your end a desire, an earnest thirst or hunger for that, for forgiveness of sins, to know Jesus? You see, that's where the question is. It's not about quantity, really, but about quality. Are you satisfied with your life? Because ultimately, the woman at the well, she was convinced that something was missing in her life. And the Lord Jesus broke into her, into her life by planting thoughts about, there's something supernatural about this man. He knew this, he knew that. He offered me this, he offered that. And then she thought, not only that Jesus knew about her, but I don't have what he's offering me. You see, I want you to think, if you don't know Jesus, the reason why it misses the mark, it doesn't help you, is because you, you are not thoughtful. You do not think, I do not have what the Bible is offering me, not just salvation, but another world. 
The world of the spirit, the world of your soul. Have you thought about that? You see, do you have a hunger and thirst for that? Because if you don't, we can throw it at you. We can pray for you. We can preach louder. We can articulate the best we can through teaching and preaching. But unless you have a desire and a thirst to know God, to have forgiveness of sins, to know Jesus, to sense that there's another world, that I have a soul, I'm not ready. Unless you have an unsettling sense that I've missed it all. As long as you're duped to believe that it's quantity and not quality. You see, I, when I'm at Central Avenue, I'm very fond of saying and quoting the Lord Jesus by saying this, that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Because the whole world believes that, and you believe that too, if you're lost, that your life is, consists of all the, lift, all the different gadgets and things that life can give me, whether it is money, whether it's a good lo looking boyfriend or an attractive girlfriend or a vacation or a car or a drug or an experience or a high or a new thing. If you think life consists of experience, which they say is the focus of millennials, but others as well, as long as you think that the totality of your life consists of the material, then you will not have a hunger or thirst for the supernatural, the spiritual, what Jesus offers. You'll miss it all. It won't resonate with you. And that's why you go from sermon to sermon. Even though eternal life is offered, forgiveness of sins, knowing God, having a home in eternity, having a place prepared for you. None of that interests you, you see, because you're interested in quantity, material quantity, and you believe that your life does consist of the abundance of the things that you can acquire. And because you think that, you're, you will never receive anything spiritual and you'll never get saved. So, the woman at the well ultimately got saved because she thought he is offering me something different, something I don't have. Not quantitatively necessarily, not just I can just drink of him and never have to drink again. No, it's the quality of the life, not the material amount that you could acquire. You see, that was the problem with the man who thought that he prepared for his life. He acquired all his wealth in the barn, but he wanted more. Let me tear down that barn and let me build a bigger one and let us eat, drink, and be merry. That's the stuff of you, of what you believe, that your life does consist of the abundance of the things which you possess. If you don't believe that, you're one step away from salvation. If you believe in the immaterial, of the eternal soul, and I can never be satisfied by stuff, by experience, by sex, by having a good looking wife or husband, the material, if you thought in your mind that will not satisfy, then you will be open to be, to think that maybe Jesus, maybe I need Jesus to satisfy my soul, the immaterial, the part that I can't fill. But if you're satisfied with what you can see and what the world is after, what social media tells you what you need, that's a whole part of business. Convincing you of something you need that you don't need. You need Christ, but do you have a thirst for him? Do you have a hunger for him? Do you want to know God? And if you don't want to know the immaterial if you don't see the need of your soul, then you can hear sermon after sermon. All the while you're thinking, I need more stuff, more experience, more education, more standing. More privilege. 
more respect from men. And you never think that your life will, is not complete without God. You see, God made you in his image and you will never be complete. No matter how much stuff you get, that's what the world tells you. And you're so busy chasing after it. Through social media, clicking a like. You're addicted, as you know, by the dopamine. And you have no long range perspective at all, not only in your life, but about what about eternity? You're so short sighted. You got to look up. Jesus says, look up because your redemption draws nigh. Jesus is coming back. But you could care less because this whole world of the Bible doesn't interest you. You have no need for it, no need of Jesus, no need of God. And of course, how can you pay attention to the offer of salvation when it's something not relevant to you? Yes, do a heart check. To what does your heart beat to? To the drumbeat of the world? You will march lockstep to that. Well, what about the offer of salvation? What about the offer of living water? You see, does that wet your thirst and appetite? Because if it doesn't, you will never trust Christ because that is what he offers you. Forgiveness of sins, eternal life with God, not more stuff. The only stuff that you'll get from Jesus is the stuff that really matters. God. Eternal life. Not the material, but what is needful for you. What is needful? You need Jesus. You don't know how desperately you need him. And if you would just get a sliver of the sense of the need, you see you're dying, you're drying up spiritually. You're famished spiritually yet your sensory organ is dead and we offer life here through christ but you don't sense your death and so you don't sense your need for life think men think women you have an eternal soul contemplate the thought and you need to prepare to meet god because you have sin and you're not ready to meet God, don't wait till you're surprised when you stand before the bar of God. Some people here are content. Yes, even to make the church, local church their home. I'm glad you do. And I'm glad you have. Some are content to think, well, I'm a disciple now. I'm just going to stick with it. You're on the wrong path. You haven't even entered the path of spirituality. You haven't even thought about your soul. There's no projection. I can't draw. There's no two points to go to a line because you're just a dot. And that dot is not even in the spiritual realm. I'm talking to many here. They're so deceived in their mind and nothing ever speaks to them. Because your soul is not a priority. In fact, to you, your soul is non-existent. I'm speaking a different language. And there's no intersection. May God have mercy to give you a thirst of what you really need. Because your soul is starved nigh to death. And except you sense, I am incomplete. I am separate from God because of sin and i'm not right i'm not complete i'm not whole and unless you stop searching for it materially to to fill more need to fill a niche get out of that rat trap that the world has deceived you and commune with your soul and look yourself in the mirror and that's what god did for me when i was a kid i would look in the mirror when I was a child, I look in the mirror. I says, what is this? This is not real. This is a covering. But who am I? What's inside? I knew I had an eternal soul and I didn't know God. And I had a deep void in my soul that nothing in the world could fill. And I had a longing for to know God. 
a longing for forgiveness, to have intimacy with God. I knew I was incomplete. What about you? Perhaps just now God is speaking to you. Perhaps just now God is showing you, perhaps Pastor Chan is right, that I really haven't found God. Yes, I have plans, just like everyone else. And just like everyone else, it'll be a dead end. Yes, you'll get somewhere. But think about it. You get what you want in this world, but in the end, what was it for? You were made in the image of God. Think about it. We're able to think and to sense, I'm here for a purpose. Where am I going? Why am I here? What is my purpose in life? How do I know God? Commune with your soul and God will reveal himself to you. He will make that void felt. He will make, he will give you thirst for living waters if you would, but consider what he says in his word. And may the Holy Spirit of God speak to someone here. May it make it palpably real to you so that you can sense, yes, I need God. I need forgiveness of sins. I need Jesus. When you look at the people, you're so blind. You don't think. Why are these people doing these things? As Brother Melo said, why are they living for Christ? God gives you palpable evidence. What's, what's, what's with these people? Do you ever think? It's a reflection of spirituality. It's a reflection of the God whom we know and whom we move and have our being. What about you? This is not just a play, you see. Let me tell you one thing and I'm done. Shakespeare was right. In the world of the physical, it's all just a play and a stage show. Shakespeare said, life is like a stage where there's entrances and exits. Isn't that true of you? Aren't you acutely aware of those who you want to make impression on? Don't you march to the drumbeat of respect and, and authority and influence? Isn't that what you want ultimately in your life? You're on a stage. You're not being true. It's deceitful. But God who sees all knows your heart. Stop playing a game with God. You're a sinner. Own up to it. You know, and your sins are not forgiven. Own up to it. Get off that stage and stand naked before God because that's how he sees you. And come to terms with your creator. He's provided a way out, a way of escape. He's a God of judgment. But in his love and mercy, he provides an alternative through Christ. Come to Christ. Be forgiven of your sins. Don't delay. Don't wait for another sermon. God might not speak to you again. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, I pray that thou would have great mercy upon these that have heard the gospel so many times. Speak to them just now that the Lord Jesus Christ did die for their sins to pay for the wickedness that they have done through their warped and fallen heart, God that he shed his blood to purify them, to make them clean, and to give them his righteousness. God, right now, create a need in the heart of some who are lost, that they, like the woman at the well, would sense that they need to drink of this living water. They need to have Christ. They need to have open up for them the eternal world and have their eternal soul to be forgiven and prepared to meet you. God, move now through thy spirit to convince, to compel, to constrain, bind the evil one, and have thy will to be done, the life of a lost sinner. Draw one to thy son. God, I pray for thy mercy to hear our prayers, to be with thy people, to help thy people. Lord, bless the food they're about to receive. Bless our fellowship and bless thy church, O oh God. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're excused. Thank you.